My name is Dean Sullivan, and I did this work jointly with uh, Orlando Arias and uh, Travis Mead at the University of Central Florida, and my advisor, Dr. Yir Jin, at the University of Florida. Um, basically, what we present is a new timing channel uh, that is a result of speculatively executing younger writes uh, with falsely aliasing older loads. And this is a side effect of uh, a process of uh, memory ordering in the memory order buffer. And we found that this is uh, actually measurable across address spaces. So that means we can observe it across processes and virtual machines. And then we use this. Uh, to demonstrate uh, a fast and robust covert channel on an infrastructure as a service public clouds and as a practical multi-tenant detection method. So just to give you some background uh, from what motivates our work is in a typical multi-core architecture, we're going to have uh, core private resources and uh, shared resources. So in this case, we have a core zero with several hyper threads and what's bounded in the box here is gonna be private and what's bounded by the other box is gonna be shared. So when you launch a covert channel in the cloud, uh, prior work basically relies on this shared resource in general because it's kind of difficult to get a covert channel working with the same core resource. And this makes sense because the shared resource is going to be observable across the address space more reliably. And a lot of great work has made these covert channels fast, robust, and practical. Uh, but they're bounded by the time to access the shared resource, and they're susceptible to detection as they're a common technique that's uh, deployed. So what we want to do then is ask ourselves, can we do as good or potentially better with a core private resource? And as a spoiler alert, um, we can do better in terms of channel capacity with a core private resource because we're using a faster uh, clock, and we can do as good with respect to multi-tenant detection uh, in a cross-core scenario with our core private resource. So rather than using the LLC, we're gonna use uh, whatever's uh, private to a particular core in a multi-core architecture. So why would we wanna do this? And the basic scenario is really easy to understand. If we can make our covert channel faster, then we can send more data. And if we can make it core private, then we can avoid detection from methods that are uh, available on public clouds already. So if we go back to our multi-core architecture, what we're gonna um, see is a partial memory hierarchy. Um, actually, the complete memory hierarchy is comprised of this picture right here that we demonstrate, and this includes a memory order buffer, which is comprised of a store buffer and a load buffer, which is private to each individual core. So the memory order buffer handles in-flight memory, in memory loads and stores that execute out of order and speculatively. So this is gonna be employed for enforcing memory ordering rules so that we get the correct values when we retire loads and stores. And it's generally used to dynamically extract instruction level parallelism using two processes, uh, memory disambiguation prediction and store to load forwarding. So what is 4K aliasing? Uh, if you look into Intel documentation, you're gonna find that it assumes dependency between four kilobyte separated loads and stores. And the motivation behind this is uh, also similar, is simple to understand, is that this avoids potential write after read data hazards. So if a later write passes an earlier read, then in, it's possible that that earlier read could lo um, load incorrect data. And this is gonna result in an incorrect value observable to the user. So a side effect of this, however, is that falsely aliasing four kilobyte loads are gonna be observable as well. And you can actually um, see this through this example that I'm gonna provide, where we have in program order a load and a store. Now the microarchitecture is free to issue these instructions in any order it pleases, so we could actually issue the store first and the load second. So if the store issues, then it's gonna basically insert into the memory order buffer uh, the address that, that it's storing to. At some later time, our load address is going to execute, and if it doesn't 4K alias with any entry in the memory order buffer, then it's free to execute and retire without uh, enc encountering any uh, data hazards. However, if the load address does 4K alias, then you have to reissue that instruction and any instruction in its dependency chain. You can actually observe this in a simple memory copy routine where the performance falls off when the source and destination buffer are separated by multiples of 4K. 
So once we've established that the 4K aliasing uh, event actually exists and Intel is right in terms of like telling us that it, it's, it's an effect of these falsely aliasing 4K uh, loads and stores, what we want to do is figure out how we can use it as a timing channel. So our general technique is to first fill the memory order buffer using stores in a single process with four kilobyte aligned addresses. So we could go ahead and fill up our, our memory order buffer. And then at a later time, in a separate process, we're going to try and issue loads that are also four kilobyte aligned. And when we do this and then measure the associated latency, what we find is that a 4K aliasing load is going to be slower than if it doesn't, than there, if there are no four kilobyte aligned addresses in the memory order buffer. So in our work, what we do is we iteratively build up the uh, measurement and timing characteristics of the 4K aliasing event from a single process to across processes, across cores. Then we move up into a more practical scenario in the cloud and try to measure 4K aliasing across virtual machines. And then we move up and try and measure 4K aliasing across accounts. So when we do our single process scenario, we, across uh, some recent Intel microarchitectural families, we observe an average cycle latency that's roughly stable with limited noise. However, the second we extend this across processes in the Haswell microarchitectural, we start seeing considerable background noise. So the question we have to answer now is can we eliminate this background noise? What we found is that there's a linear correlation between the number of aliasing loads and the cycle latency that we measure. So we can improve the latency that we measure in the 4K aliasing event by adding more loads within our measurement window. Another aspect of the 4K aliasing is the frequency with which we pull for the 4K aliasing event. So we can issue a load that's 4K aligned every address, every other address, every fourth address. In this case, we see a bimodal distribution when we issue it every half, uh, half when we measure four kilobyte aligned loads half the time, and we could clearly distinguish the four kilobyte aligned signal. However, we get a very noisy threshold between no 4K or 4K events. If we do this every 16th time, then our 4K signal sort of disappears, but we get a very clear threshold. So we have to find some sort of balance and trade-off in what we're going to do in terms of measurement. And that basically motivates this chart right here, which shows that um, when we're sending a one bit, we observe a best case error rate when we pull for the 4K event every fourth load. For the zero bit, it's going to be better when we pull every other load. So we are establishing a covert channel, so we need to talk about a protocol. What we, what we used in order to detect our sender is a one wire communication protocol where we prepend a zero and a one to the header and footer of every bit that we're sending. This allows us to automatically detect the sender. When we want to detect the receiver, we use this tight store to load forwarding loop. And the basic insight is that there's going to be competition for hyperthreading resources that are going to degrade the performance of that uh, store, to fo store to load forwarding loop. In terms of message recovery, we use initialization and completion messages. And this is because our channel is going to be fast, so we can deal with repeated tries. And we can make this even better by breaking the message up into packets to limit the, um, the impact of retransmission. Our in-house channel capacity measurements show here, shown here demonstrate that for our theoretical calculation, the, actually the best error rate that we observe is not going to occur every other load address. In fact, it's going to occur when we separate every eighth address. However, the experimentation uh, is in line with our theoretical calculations with respect to sending a one bit. In the in-house experiments, where we observe a channel capacity that's roughly 1.8 uh, megabits per second, which is considerably faster than previous work in a uh, virtual machine setting. So we're going to move this into a virtual machine scenario in a public cloud environment. But this requires hyperthreading, and you might be asking yourself, well, that's probably not going to happen. But in fact, they all do it. Every public cloud provider is going to offer hyperthreading. And Azure previously didn't do this, but then they ported it in a recent um, update. So the basic motivation behind this is that it limits the total cost of ownership to the cloud provider. When we, do our, when we perform our measurement of our covert channel in the public infrastructure as a service cloud on Amazon EC2 and Google's Compute Engine, we observe a 1.2 megabit, two megabits per second channel capacity on EC2 and a 1.5 megabits per second channel capacity on Google Compute Engine. 
So this is roughly a 30% drop from our in-house experiments and an 18% drop from our um, in-house experiments on GCE. And we can see that with higher error rate, you get a slower channel, which makes sense and in, is in line with the linear, um, the linear polling mechanism we employ for measuring 4K aliasing. So now we're gonna move and try and determine multi-tenancy now that we have a covert channel that we can measure and works reliably. So in order to do this, we have to address several challenges. Uh, the first is we need to separate 4K aliasing from such a noisy environment. So we're gonna first establish a baseline without any cooperating VMs in order to distinguish no 4K from 4K. Then we iteratively scale up our virtual machine instances while transmitting the four kilobyte aligned signal and then repeat the measurements five times so that we can take a geometric mean and establish a, a, a robust baseline. The next challenge we have to face is our launch strategy. So we are gonna use the citation here that I provided, which basically is in order um, to establish a similar launch strategy to prior approaches in order to determine uh, accurate comparisons. So we're gonna launch pairwise sender and receiver virtual machines. And these co-location strategies in this paper that I mentioned are gonna recommend that we scale up 20 pair, uh, to 20 pairwise sender and receiver virtual machines as an upper bound. Finally, um, we're gonna, what we're gonna do in terms of, in order to detect our 4K aliasing uh, event and then uh, establish multi-tenancy, is we're going to continuously transmit a 4K aliasing signal and then intermittently pull for 4K aliasing on our receiver um, VM in a separate account. So we can decrease the measurement time by launching all of our senders at once and then sequentially launching each receiver VM every hour. So what we see when we do this is that in uh, Amazon EC2, after launching 16 uh, virtual machine instances, that the background noise without the sender is clearly distinguishable and distinct from the 4K aliasing event um, when we start transmitting that through our sender virtual machines. So what we've done here is basically, each in each case on EC2 and GCE, we pairwise um, launch 16 virtual machines and 14 virtual machines, respectively, from separate accounts. Uh, the receiver is basically polling for the 4K aliasing event, and the sender from a separate account is sending this event. We do this, um, and we're able to achieve uh, as good as cross-core multi-tenant detection techniques with respect to both launch strategy and the number of instance pairs that we launch to detect multi-tenancy. So for the careful listener of this talk, you might have noticed that I passed on um, this scenario right here. And that's because when we ran this scenario and tried to measure 4K aliasing across cores, we weren't able to actually see it and observe it, which was disappointing because Intel actually does maintain some patented documentation that indicates that you actually can observe 4K aliasing across cores. And this is actually um, an interesting line of research, research and anybody um, willing to investigate it can come speak with me after the talk. And I'd be happy to engage in any conversation therein. So in conclusion, uh, we show that the 4K aliasing event uh, that uses speculation on memory instructions and microarchitecture used to maintain memory consistency. This is just another example of how speculative execution is a new attack vector in a public cloud environment. We demonstrate this 4K aliasing event on the public IAS clouds for uh, a fast and robust covert channel and a practical multi-tenant detection scheme that's comparable to cross-core events with respect to multi-tenancy detection and achieves a better channel capacity uh, with respect to cross-core events as a covert channel. Uh, thank you. And I'll take any questions. No, I don't think so at all. Um, no. Okay. Yeah, no, so it's because I think that security is a function of use, right? So side channel attacks um, were been around for a decade or so, a little over, and there was limited um, 
there was a, a, a limited interest with respect to them because there was no environment in which we could use the attack setting. And, but as data centers and public clouds became you know, relevant and practical use cases where people are porting their, in, you know, we're gonna have multi-tenant detection, we're gonna have multiply, mutually distrusting parties all on a, on a cloud environment, then it becomes relevant all of a sudden, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't really think it's necessarily that it's, it, we're bad at it, it's that attacks are gonna become relevant and irrelevant and oscillate according to use case. So how do we fix it? Um, how do we fix Meltdown or Spectre, or how do we fix this guy? Any of them. So this one is very, I think it's very simple to fix this, is like, if you, if, I think if cloud providers just weren't as interested in lowering the total cost of ownership, then you could just eliminate hyper-threading. So I was interested to see that Azure, who previously wouldn't allow hyper-threading for the specific use case of these L1 and L2 based core private side channels that were published in the early uh, 2000s, um, they actually, you know, ported their, their they added support in Hyper-V for hyper-threading, so you could just eliminate it that way. Um, but that's reactionary, of course, and yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions?